Let me remind where we stopped yesterday, and I will repeat some uh, uh, important uh, things which we actually discussed and uh, try to explain a little bit more, probably. I want you to follow all these things. So remember, uh, we discussed flavor states and mass states, and when, when we are saying that we produce electron neutrino, this means that we are producing a combination of mass states. And then, uh, so we describe these mass states uh, using wave packets so that uh, this electron neutrino evolves in some, into some state um, which can be written as the sum over mass states if we consider evolution in vacuum, in matter it will be eigenstate of, uh, of neutrinos in, uh, in matter. Then we have these elements of mixing matrix which tells you, if you produce electron neutrino, what is the amount of uh, eigenstate uh, I in the electron neutrino. And then we introduce wave function of the eigenstate. And then we have this new I. OK? And we are working here actually in this factorization approximation, which means that we consider all the process, production, evolution, and detection of neutrinos, we split it in three parts, production independently, assuming that there is no much not much evolution in the production region. And so we are focusing now on evolution of neutrino, which is the second phase, and then it will be detection. We also have uh, split it this wave function of the uh, eigenstates in two parts. One is the phase factor. And another one is the shape factor. And an approximation when we use just uh, two terms in expansion of energy over uh, momenta over the average momenta in the wave packet, we get this shape factor which depends only on such a combination of uh, distance, time, and vi is the group velocity. And this is approximately 1 minus mi square over 2 energies taking into account that square, taking into account that neutrinos are ultra relativistic, and so you just make here expansion of P or E if you want, and so you get this expression for the group velocity. Neutrinos have small masses, and therefore this velocity is very close to, to one. But what is important that this group velocity is different for different mass eigenstates which means the different mass eigenstates or wave packets of different mass eigenstates propagate with different velocity. So if you take into account other terms in our expansion, then this g will depend on x or t independently also, apart from this combination. And this means that wave packet will change the shape, in particular due to spread, due to presence of different momenta. So this is interesting combination, which tells you that this factor indeed describes propagation, right? If you change t, then x changes according to, 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 to this law, right? So then x changes. Suppose you take the uh, maximum of the wave packet, and then coordinate of maximum of wave packet changes with time as vi times t, which means that this shape factor describes propagation of the wave packet, right? This is the propagation term. And the picture you see here precisely reflects uh, uh, these expressions. So uh, I have shown these uh, shape factors. Probably I should say another uh, also uh, at the following. For simplicity, I will consider just two neutrino case, not three, but two neutrino case, for several reasons. First of all, it's easy just to see the, the results. And the second one, it also has a practical meaning because in many situations, 
three neutrino problem, three neutrino mixing, reduces to two neutrinos. So we consider two neutrino case for simplicity. And uh, in this case, the mixing matrix becomes just two by two matrix, right? And in two by two case, we have just one uh, mixing angle. So this matrix becomes just cosine theta, sine theta, minus sine theta, and cosine theta. And this matrix connects my flavor states. In this case, for instance, new E and new mu. Sometime I will use uh, some other one. It connects this with mass states, new one and new two, right? So in many cases, I will consider just two neutrino situation. So then this sum will be just sum of two terms, right, which correspond to nu1 and nu2. And you see here precisely this combination. So it will be cosine, which is just ue1 in the two neutrino case, then shape factor, then the phase factor, and this is nu1, and this is for the second state, sine theta, then gain shape factor, phase factor, and nu2. And what you see here precisely corresponds to uh, this expression. So we have this shape factor, and then this periodic structure is inscribed. We just follow from, uh, from this phase. Well, actually, what one needs to write, not just up, but it should be symmetrically down. So it's like, because you have this E, and even in complex uh, space. But for simplicity, I'm just using this type, and many people are using just this type of picture for the wave packets. Questions? I will use this picture several times, so it's better if you understand and ask me questions now. Oh, please uh, give the, the microphone. Or you can give me, I will run. All right, just to, to have some exercise. Uh, do you just say that the three neutrino mixing is reducing to two neutrino mixing, but I didn't actually understand why do you say that. And so we know that there are three neutrinos, right? Now I'm saying that in various cases, uh, and you can, should consider, of course, evolution of uh, whole the system, which includes third neutrino. But for instance, in the first approximation, since one three mixing is small, in the first approximation, we just uh, can uh, take it to be zero. What we will see later that uh, mass differences, and you probably saw already in the one of the first pic uh, uh, pictures, uh, are quite different. So there are three states, and the mass split is different. There are hierarchy of splits of the masses. You will see that uh, in this case, uh, you will have two kind of uh, uh, scales of oscillation phenomena. One is, is short scale relatively, it depends on the mass. Another one is big one. So in some experiments, which we have short baseline, then you can neglect long baseline uh, effects and therefore the problem again reduces effectively to two neutrinos. More questions? Now you see here uh, also that each of these uh, wave packets has uh, two components, red one and green one, right? And this is because uh, we have electron neutrino and muon neutrino, and you see this expression, which just corresponds to uh, such a relation in this mixing matrix. But you can invert these expressions and express new one and new two in terms of new E and new mu, right? which means that each of these eigenstates, mass eigenstates, is again, it has a, a composite flavor, not pure flavor, and this is the essence of mixing. And we also uh, saw this picture last lecture when I showed the spectrum of neutrinos, okay? So this is complete description of electron neutrino. Now you see here green part here and green part here. And so you can wonder again why this muon neutrino appears into electron neutrino. And the point is that in, uh, in the production point, when the phase difference is zero, so this is the phase difference, 
then these green parts which uh, will cancel each other. And so what you will see is just uh, uh, electron neutrino. So they will have uh, destructive interference. And you can just check that uh, if you write explicitly expressions that this constellation occurs. And this is because you see elect in electron neutrino, nu1 and nu2 are in phase. Here is the positive sign plus, and here the minus sign. So if in one case you have uh, uh, constructive interference, the red parts here sum up, then uh, green parts are yeah, canceling. So this is in the moment when the phase is zero. Now what happens if you produce this state? So this system of two-wave packets start to propagate. According to what is written here, according to this, it will start to propagate. The shape factor doesn't change. The form doesn't change if you neglect uh, spread of the wave packets. Okay? And also the size of the wave packets doesn't change. The size just is uh, determined by this cosine and sine. So in the process of propagation, the only what happens, the only what happens is phase difference changes between this wave packet and this wave packet. And this change of the phase difference is again due to difference of the masses. You see, we have here uh, different group velocities. Since we have different group velocities here, the velocity of this packet and this one uh, uh, is different. So actually, if they travel a long time, they start to shift with respect to each other, so upper and down wave packets, and at some point stopped overlap. And this is what is called the loss of propagation coherence. I will come to this question a bit later. Now, what is this oscillation phase? Uh, this is the difference of the phases of these two wave packets. Okay? So each of these phases is given by this expression. So this is the energy, this is momentum, this is energy and moment, average energy and moment in each packet. Right? So this is the way we derived such a formula, remember? we introduced average momentum of, uh, uh, of particle uh, and then uh, uh, defined also the energy which corresponds to this momentum. So this average energy and average momentum are determined by the production process. So you need to compute actually these things. So you consider the process of production of neutrino and you compute what is the shape of these uh, wave packets and you compute what is the average energy and average momentum. Right, so we are using this dispersion relation. Now, what, how we can write this phase difference? This is due to difference of the energies and difference of momentum, right? So this is phase difference in general. And I'm not assuming equality of energies and momentum, which is confusion point in many uh, textbook derivations. So suppose I take a given delta E, actually it's, again it is given by difference of these uh, uh, energies, average energies in each uh, wave packet. Then uh, delta P is given by this expression, so it's just delta P, uh, dP over dE, not delta E, this is Taylor expansion. And then uh, uh, dP over uh, dM square, delta M square, just Taylor expansion expansion, right? Because P depends both on uh, energy and it depends on the mass squared. Now what is staying here is uh, nothing but uh, inverse of group velocity. We already defined this here. And so this means that this expression can be written in such a way and then you can easily compute, of course, this derivative just using this. And then you get such an expression for delta P, which corresponds to a given delta E. So then we insert this delta P in such an expression. And finally, we get this formula for the phase difference, for oscillation phase. Okay, there are two terms here. One term is given by delta m squared over two energies, and x is the distance neutrino traveled. And this is kind of standard term, standard oscillation phase, which you see in all the textbooks. But there is another piece here. But it has very interesting feature. So first of all, it's given by uh, this group velocity, time minus x. And this expression 
has actually varies from zero up to the size of the wave packet, right? Because the tails are exponentially die, so the typical value of this uh, uh, expression in brackets is just the size of the wave packet, the width of the wave packet. And here is delta E, difference of average energies in the wave packets over the group velocity. So you can put here just one, and then this delta E should be proportional to delta M squared. Because if mass differences are zero, then you should not expect any difference of energy. So it should be proportional to delta M squared. So typically, this delta E is delta M squared over two energies. And now, uh, things which, are, which you see here is nothing but the phase which is acquired on the size of the wave packet. Okay? Here what is staying X, and here is sigma X. And if the size of the wave packet is very small, then you can usually neglect this term. And so you get the standard expression for the oscillation phase. So this is an important issue because there are many discussions about the oscillation phase. Some people are finding factor of two. Um, but now it's kind of more quiet period. But this is important to understand. So this is what we are getting here for the oscillation phase. To a good approximation, it's given by just this expression, but there's some small correction. And actually, this small correction also reflects a possible oscillations within the source. Because source, or size of the source, determines for you the sigma x, the size of the wave packet. And then to some extent, that reflects uh, the oscillation phase which is acquired on the small distance of the size of the wave packet. So the crucial point that this phase is proportional to delta m square and inversely proportional to the energy of neutrino. And now let me show, come back to this uh, pictorial stuff and see what happens. So what happens, the phase difference changes. So oscillation phase is proportional to x, neutrino or time, so neutrino propagates, and the phase difference changes. And what happens is if you have in initial moment something like this, then in the next moment you may have, so after a while you will have this one, when the phase difference uh, becomes pi. So that's phase is zero in the case of um, stop of oscillation. You know. Stop to oscillate. Giovanni, <laughs> oh, so it works. Oscillation stop to oscillate. So, you know, neutrinos stop to oscillate. Anyway. So this is in the case of phase of pi. You see there's a shift of the phase, relative shift of the phase. And now in such a situation, these green parts will not interfere destructively. So they will interfere constructively. And so this means that you will have appearance of muon neutrino in your neutrino flux. So that's in fact, you see, I just put relatively. I mean, that's, that's what happens for two different phases. But it's smooth process so that the phases are, uh, phase difference slowly increases. Then after a while, you will get again the phase, you will get the phase two pi, so which means that you are coming back to the original state. And so that gives you the periodic process of neutrino oscillations. Now, I didn't mention detection. Actually, detection plays a very crucial role. It's actually quite symmetric, production and the detection. And what, is, what do you see in the detector actually depends on the properties of your detector. In particular, that kind of interesting phenomena that you can even uh, restore coherence, even if it lost on the way of neutrino traveling. If you ask me, I will uh, elaborate on this more. And actually, you can introduce some kind of generalized wave packet, which takes into account properties of production and properties of the detection. And uh, in this factorization approximation, it works well. Now, let's come to oscillation probability. And uh, so with what we are computing, we have created this state, which is written here. And in two neutrino case, it was written before. And now we can compute uh, what is the probability that we will, in detector, find electron neutrinos. So we compute this matrix element. Right? So, which means that we are computing C. Now I'm writing this in terms of mass eigenstates, nu1 plus 
sine nu2. Very often I will use uh, a C and S instead of cosine and sine, and so that should be understood that this is cosine theta mixing angle. And then I have here this uh, expression which I had before. Let me show you. It was in the previous slide, just not to uh, repeat again. So this one, so I need to insert this expression. And here you see cosine here in front of new one, sine here in front of new two. And when I insert here such an expression, what I will get? So I will get using also that new i, uh, new j, they are orthogonal, so it's a delta ij. So which means that new one, new one will give me one, and new one, new two give me zero. And so I just uh, need to pick up the terms which are uh, with the same uh, labeling of eigenstates. So what I will get cosine square, right? It comes when I put, take this one, and then it will be G factor, G1, uh, plus sine square, G2, I omit here, uh, uh, these arguments, and then I will write here I to the face. I don't know if you see well here. Do you see this or not? I, I should, okay. So that is expression which, I, which I'm getting for the amplitude. And I put here the face, so I put out the factor I phi one. And I can always do this because eventually I'm computing moduli square. So the probability is given by moduli square of this expression. And uh, probably I should not write because it's written already in this step. And then. So that is expression which you saw on the blackboard. And now I need to just uh, to moduli square this and make integration. And now integration depends on how I'm organizing my experiment. And uh, so what I did here, I just integrated over dx. So I have considered uh, the probability in a given moment of time. But you can do the following. You can just fix x, but integrate over time. Because usually you are not measuring time. You get the same result. So this is expression which you get eventually for the probability. This is integral over moduli square of this expression. OK? And now what you get the following. I didn't mention this, but I should now to stress that, of course, this wave function should be normalized, right? It should, they should be normalized in a way that psi xt or k moduli square, and if it fix t and make integration over dx, it should give me 1, right? And therefore, from here, I'm getting that if I can do the same things with this uh, factor g, again, integrate over dx of g factors, then I should get again 1, because uh, that differs from psi just by this uh, exponent, right? So that moduli square of uh, shape factor integrated over x, again, should give me 1. And this simplifies a lot our expression, because here you see these two terms. And they come when we square this and then make integration, then take into account that the integral of this is 1. The second term, this 1, comes when I square this, again make integration. This produces sine to the fourth theta. And there is no shape factors here. And there is interference term, which is kind of cross term here. So it's proportional to 2 sine squared theta, cosine squared theta. Then the phase appear here, cosine phi, right, the oscillation phase. And this additional factor, which is the integral over uh, uh, the product of two shape factors. OK? Now, what is this product of these shape factors? If they overlap, if there is no separation of the wave packets, then again you get 1. And so in this case, your expression for the probability is given by such a thing. So I just put, instead of this uh, force powers, I express this as 1 minus 2 sine squared theta multiplied by cosine squared theta, and I get this expression. 
out of this immediately if the integral is one. And then I can further transform this and I'm getting such an expression which is standard oscillation formula. So the point is that, of course, you can get this oscillation formula, standard oscillation formula, just using plane waves or point-like uh, uh, presentation of neutrinos. But then you met this uh, uh, conceptual questions. You can ask also questions why we should take equal moment or equal energies. There is nothing here, no assumptions here. But you see then how you get what is behind this standard oscillation formula. Uh, for instance, behind this is assumption that you have overlap, complete overlap. Now, if your wave packet separated completely, then this integral is zero. And then you will get expression which is just cosine to the force theta and sine to the force theta. And this is nothing but expression of average oscillation probability. But of course, there are intermediate steps when you have uh, partial overlap. So let me make also a comment. You, you see, you get these expressions uh, which actually do not depend on precise shape of, uh, of, of this G. In two cases, either you have complete overlap, then it doesn't matter what is the uh, shape, and you need, do not need to make computations of your uh, production process. Or when you have complete separation of the wave packet, again, things are simple. In most of the cases, fortunately, we have such a situation. So either you have no uh, substantial shift of the wave packets, and then you get this expression, or uh, things are averaged. If you want to pick up kind of uh, a, a intermediate situation, then you are becoming sensitive to the shape factor. Questions? Oh, let me make final comment. So this oscillation phase I just reproduced again uh, uh, the same expression you saw before, and uh, one can uh, introduce the oscillation lengths, which is the distance over which the phase uh, becomes 2 pi, which means that the system is uh, back to initial state. And uh, this oscillation length is given by this expression. It's just you equate this, uh, uh, so this is the phase, and uh, so you, you get uh, equate this to 2 pi, and so you get this expression. Oscillation length is given by for pi energy over delta m squared. Okay, questions? Uh, I phase. Why it's disappear now? So again, that is, uh, you see, an assumption that uh, I can neglect oscillation effects on the distance of the size of the wave packet, assuming that a uh, wave packet is short enough. And usually we deal with sizes of the wave packet, which is uh, maybe 10 to the minus 6 centimeters, maybe 10 to the minus 11 centimeters, and the oscillation lengths are kilometers or meters, kilometers, which is much, much bigger, than, which means that with very high accuracy, you can actually neglect uh, this. However, in some very specific situations, you uh, may still take into account this additional term. So this is neglecting this additional term. Actually, you see explicitly what are really assumptions behind uh, this uh, uh, usual oscillation formula. Yeah? Uh, let's see. Can you repeat that? So which one? Uh, the oscillation length. The oscillation lengths. Yes, because this is m square, this is inverse of the mass, and this is energy here. So it's one over energy, which is uh, the length. I don't get it. To what energy it corresponds to that energy we used during in previous in phase and so on and so forth. Uh, so, look, uh, you are right, because in this system there are even two average energies, right? Even, even more energies, because your wave packet is actually a collection of the energies. So, when I have no difference of energies, I just put one energy. Uh, if there are some differences, energy is important in some, then I write this explicitly. Because uh, this difference of the energy is extremely small, it's much, much, much smaller than the energy itself. Okay, so it's just uh, to avoid these many 
indices, I just put E, which means that kind of uh, one of the energies in, 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 of neutrino in, in this wave packet. And the situation is the same for other energies in the wave packet. Okay, uh, in the oscillation phase, we can see the energy dependence. Yes. It seems to be that it is useful to actually observe the sinusoidal pattern of oscillation by changing the energy of neutrino beam. Was it done, actually, in the experiment? Absolutely, yeah. So I will discuss this at length, but this is kind of next topic of what I'm going to speak. You can observe oscillations in two different ways. Either you can fix the energy or some energy interval and uh, look how things change with the distance. But more often, we are doing precisely this, what you are saying, fixed distance because you have a source and you have detector and a fixed distance, and then you study what happens for different energies. And then you will see oscillatory pattern, but an energy scale. Um, my question is just in continuation to the question asked by another participant. You were mentioning that the, most of the problems uh, in the neutrino oscillations, you had said that it can be reduced to two neutrino problems. The main motivation behind this reduction is just that uh, one three mixing angle you mentioned that it's... Uh, but as far as I understand, the hierarchy in the neutrino mixing angles is not that small. Yeah. Uh, it's not that large, sorry. Right. So, uh I just don't want, you know, I'm lazy and I don't want to bother too much you with long formula. So actually what you need to write, you need to write three terms in uh, the expression here. All right, so it's uh, three terms in expression here. And then you will have how many? At least three interference terms, right? Just to avoid, this is for simply, I, I want to kind of turn the, to, uh, to tell you what is what are conceptual issues, but then I will show you the results and uh, analysis is done in three neutrinos. You are right in many cases. Uh, you cannot neglect the third mixing, and it is important. And uh, especially with present-day accuracy of measurements, so this is crucial to make uh, to take into account all three uh, uh, all three uh, oscillation modes. Yeah, but. In principle, conceptually, everything is here. So what I was telling you, you will have three wave packets, then you will have interference of three wave packets, then each of these wave packets will have three colors, and then you need to consider all possible interferences, etc. But it's just lengthy, but the same thing. Then you will have two different oscillation lengths because you have two different delta M squares. Okay, so shall I continue? So what I have shown you before was uh, survival probability. So um, we have produced uh, electron neutrino and then I was asking what is the probability to find again electron neutrinos in my detector? Uh, but you can also find what is uh, the transition probability or appearance, sorry. Uh, and then it's just one minus expression which you saw before, and so this is expression for uh, the transition probability. It's given by uh, sine squared theta uh, to theta, and then this oscillatory factor. And you see here that the depth of oscillation is determined by mixing angle, by sine squared to theta. So that was, if mixing is small, then you will have oscillations with very small depths. If it's maximal, then you have maximal oscillation depths. So there are some repetitions of what I have said already. Uh, you see all the complications are absorbed, at least in this derivation, in normalization uh, or reduced to partial averaging of the oscillation pattern. Now, let me repeat again, the oscillation is the effect of phase difference change. You will see some other effects which have uh, some other degrees of freedom, but here the only degree of freedom which is operating is the phase and phase difference. So oscillation is the effect of phase difference increase, or monotonous phase difference increase with distance. And the phase here is just proportional to the distance over time of propagation. Admixtures of mass eigenstates 
uh, in a given propagating state do not change. So the sizes of the wave packs and the shape factors do not change here in our, at least in our approximation. And also flavor composition of individual eigenstate is fixed by just mixing angle. So this is inversion of formulas which I have shown before. Now there are some slides with, you know, with stars here, which I don't want to go into uh, and to discuss, but if you ask me later, I can answer, I can come back to this. So one is this uh, explanation of uh, uh, this loss of coherence in the propagation. And what is interesting, you can actually restore, in spite of the fact that uh, your wave packets arrived already separated, in principle, detection process can again uh, uh, restore this coherence, and you may see interference picture. But for this, you need to have very good energy resolution or long time of detection process, coherent time. And you see, it's like the case of the pendulum. Suppose you have pendulum, okay? And then one wave packet arrives, so it stays here, and knock it. So it starts to, you know, to vibrate. Now, if you have friction, and when the second wave packet arrives, it stays again, it again knock it, but then vibration will be independent on what you had before. But suppose you have very small friction, so very good impedance. So the first wave packet came, knock your system, it started to vibrate. Then when second arrived, it still continued to vibrate, and then effect of the second heat will depend on what happened before. So this is more or less uh, uh, the kind how uh, coherence can be restored in the detector. So you need to have very long coherence time of detection for this. Uh, another important thing which I want to just mention is the equivalence of the pictures in uh, momentum representation space and uh, configuration space. So what I have discussed is the pattern in configuration space, right? How things develop in, uh, in the X or in coordinate, in usual coordinates. But in quantum mechanics, we have this equivalence. But you can consider all the things in just an energy momentum space. And there's kind of one-to-one -one equivalence of what I have discussed here and what you can get uh, in, in this energy momentum consideration. And in this connection, I can just mention this uh, famous Todolsky theorem, who was saying that actually, if you want to compute observational effects in your detector, you can forget about wave packets and just to make a correct integration over energy of the produced spectrum and energy resolution of your detector. And you will get equivalent result, which is true. But if you ask me, I can elaborate more. And uh, finally, it's another with stars. This is what is called the spread of the wave packets. And the spread uh, is given by such an expression. It's mass square over energy of neutrino cube. This is the size of the wave packet in the energy space, and this is the length, it's just uh, length of propagation. So what happens is you had such a narrow wave packet and it becomes very wide. What's interesting that when this wave packet becomes very wide, actually there is a loss of coherence even within the wave packet. So it's kind of, it becomes more like a classical. And the effect is nothing but uh, uh, related to the fact that high energies will arrive first. So neutrinos with higher energies in your wave packet will arrive first, and then lower energies later. In the wave packet, you have the spectrum of energies, right? So some, some uh, interval of energies. And when your wave, uh, system travels long, then the first what is arriving uh, are high energy pieces of your wave packet. So um, suppose we kind of solve all these problems with wave packet, with coherence, with everything, and then the problem is reduced to some extent to point-like problem. Forget all these complications, and now let's uh, do the following. So let's take uh, this vector with uh, uh, three neutrinos, so selector, neutrino, muon, and tau. And uh, evolution of these uh, neutrinos, at least in flavor space, can be described by such an equation, which is just usual Schrodinger equation, where Hamiltonian is given by mass matrix multiplied by mass matrix dagger over two energies, approximately, and plus I have written already in general some potential. So let me explain this expression, because we will use this equation. 
So this part is vacuum part, what we call, and actually this is nothing but generalization of such an expression for energy. In alpha relativistic case, you will have energy equals to P plus M square over two energies, right? This is just for one particle. Now, now we have three particles, and generalization is straightforward. It is just then instead of M square, you will have mass matrix square, this three by three matrix multiplied by mass matrix dagger, and this took two energies, okay? And actually this part can be written in terms of uh, mixing matrices and uh, diagonal matrix. So you can write this as, this is our CKM matrix. This is CKM matrix dagger, and these are uh, masses of uh, square of, uh, of neutrinos. And this is in flavor basis. Now, in many situations, I will just assume that mass matrix of charged lepton is diagonal, so we are working in flavor basis. This is already reflected by the fact that I'm using here electron, muon, and tau neutrino wave functions. Now, if neutrinos are propagating in medium, and they are interacting with medium, then you will have some additional term in your Hamiltonian, and this is uh, V, which is staying here. And I will discuss this later. Okay, so essentially now we need to solve these equations for different situations. And different situations means that uh, different distances and different shape of the potential, etc. Now very important thing, and I again want you to really to pick up this because things become very simple if you use uh, uh, this graphic representation. It's very easy, but you see, many things will be understood very, in a very simple way if you understand this. So we use wave functions. However, we can introduce uh, polarization vectors. So now I'm again back to two neutrino case, just for simplicity. Of course, you can do, uh, generalize this for, for three neutrino, okay? So we introduce polarization vector, which is just this wave function, the two by two. This is sigma matrix, Pauli matrix. And again, this psi. This is definition if you want, right? Now explicitly the components, and now we have three components, right? Because we have here three Pauli matrices. So uh, these three explicitly components are given here so that uh, it's a real part of the wave function of electron neutrino. By the way, here I even put just uh, neutrino signs without psi. So that's meant that this is wave function of uh, of a given neutrino. So three components are here uh, written here. It's a real part of uh, this product. Uh, is this a new, uh, new, new E dagger, new here, tau, then imaginary part, and then Z component is just given by a wave function of E dagger, wave function of E minus one half. Now, uh, Evolution equation, which I have written already before, is given by such an expression. And in two neutrino case, it can be rewritten in such a form. It's just not, nothing uh, uh, more complicated, but uh, when you express your Hamiltonian in terms of uh, uh, mass eigenvalues and mixing angles, and in this case, it's just one mixing angle, then you get expression for this B, which is written here. It has three components. This is one, two pi over oscillation lengths. And again, in general, I'm writing here the oscillation lengths in medium. It is valid in vacuum, or it also valid in medium. I want to have a more general immediately. So three components. This is the first, sine two theta mixing angle, zero and this cosine two theta. It's just expression for the Hamiltonian in two neutrino case rewritten in terms of mixing parameters and mass eigenvalues. So let me maybe, I will, again, so, so that's, I'm using for this mass matrix such an expression, right, which I can always do. So these are uh, uh, mixing matrices, and in two neutrino cases, just expre expressed in terms of one mixing angle. Okay, now what I'm doing is the following. I take this P, and I want to find, uh, uh, now, evolution equation for this polarization vector. What I'm doing, I'm just differentiating this equation, and I will get two terms, so why I'm uh, differentiating this, psi dagger, and the second one, why I'm di differentiating this one, psi, and then I use this uh, 
evolution equation to express these derivatives. And I'm coming to such an expression. Now, see this and uh, ask me questions. But, but if you are really interested, I mean, that's uh, five minutes uh, derivation. It's nothing complicated. So do I understand how it was derived? Right? So this is the definition. I dif differentiated this P over T. So I get expression which actually is uh, derivatives of psi and then psi, then here's psi and here's derivative of psi. And I used uh, this uh, evolution equation for psi. Yeah? Why don't you solve the entire system from the beginning? You just diagonalize the two matrix, right? Sorry, two? I couldn't you solve the, the evolution equation by just diagonalizing the two matrix, the three matrix? Oh, yeah, so, so in terms of just wave functions, right? Yeah. Well, yes, so in many cases we are doing this, but uh, let me tell you the following. So you will see how things become very visible and simple if I use this polarization vector. So you can do this, of course. Actually, this is the way to solve using density matrix. Actually, components of this P are the elements of density matrix. But in some cases, like collective effects in supernova, which when you have also scattering of neutrinos or antineutrinos, I cannot imagine, it's so complicated to solve in terms of wave functions. Using this uh, uh, formalism, it becomes much, much easier. And you will see these examples. So what is this equation? Tell me. So if it resembles for you something, so what is this? Yeah? So this is expression for spin precession of electron and magnetic field. If I'm identifying B with magnetic field, so this is the expression for B, it's 2 pi, this is oscillation length, and it's sine cosine. Then my vector P, according to this equation, will just precess around this vector B. So this is beauty of physics, when you have uh, observed the same phenomena, sorry, uh, and they, sorry, when you have different phenomena, and actually there is the same physics behind. And here we see this analogy, so they we develop this to, uh, to describe oscillations. But it is nothing but precession of spin of the electron. And here you see uh, uh, this picture. So you have this P vector, and this is the space in, in which this vector is uh, moving. Now, uh, precession occurs around the vector B. And actually, vector B, if you saw this expression for, for B, it's a uh, uh, two theta angle inclined with respect to this uh, axis Z. Now, this direction of axis Z correspond to pure electron neutrino state. You see, what is here is uh, PEE, probability to find electron neutrino, minus one half. So if this PEE is one, which means that you have electron neutrino, then you will have uh, this axis, uh, uh, you, you have this vector here, it's just one half, okay? So if you have PEE zero, which means that your electron neutrino completely converted to another neutrino species, then your vector is down. So that's, that's uh, notation. So up means electron neutrino, and uh, down means muon neutrino, or whatever it is. And then magnetic field vector is inclined here. It has uh, angle 2 theta m. So this, the axis is determined by mixing angle. And what happens is the following. You produce electron neutrino, and so uh, your uh, neutrino vector in initial state is just uh, like here. It's uh, directed in this way. But then the evolution will be just precession of this neutrino vector around uh, this axis on the surface of the cone. And the cone angle is just uh, 2 uh, theta m, or 2 theta in, in, in vacuum. So then if you have this evolution, of course, projection of uh, uh, our vector on the axis Z changes periodically. And this is just an analogy of oscillation because uh, the probability of PEE is just given by this uh, 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 projection onto axis Z plus one half. So if you want to find what is the probability to find electron neutrino, you need to project your vector onto this axis Z 
and add one half. Questions? Yeah, that's. Uh, while defining this polarization vector, we are using the two flavors, that is new E and new tau. Uh, that is uh, probably you are considering the atmospheric uh, uh, neutron oscillations. Well, uh, so again, I will tell you how to apply this for specific systems. But for me, it can be new mu new tau, I can do this, and then it will be for atmospheric neutrino, the main channel, but many others. So I will apply this type of the pattern for uh, different channels and different situations. But you can consider this as a kind of toy model if you want to explain uh, to you this uh, graphic representation. And now what's going on, oscillation is just this process. You know, our neutrino vector. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, so I will just show you and then you can ask again. So, uh, so that's, that's the procedure, right? So that's uh, how things, so the vector is moving around this axis. Yeah? Sorry, yeah. So please just go back to slides where you generalize the Hamiltonian for matter effect. Uh, I will discuss matter effect next, so that uh, that will be in details. Yeah, that's one. Mm, no, no, yeah. yeah, this one. So uh, when you write the Hamiltonian, you just, uh, uh, say E is P plus M square by twi and twi C. So I understand that this M square by twi C is generalized to MM dagger by twi C and this interaction potential comes due to the matter effects. But uh, why there is no P in matter effects? Good question. Yeah, I have forgotten to tell you. <laughs> so, good, thanks. You know, uh, what matters here is the difference. Some, some terms here which are different for different neutrino species. So, if you have some contribution to this Hamiltonian, which is the same for all three neutrinos, it will not produce any effect. So uh, here we simplified many things. In particular, here we are considering that P is the same for, for all three neutrinos. Okay, so and then we can remove this term. But we can do the same if we are using the same energies or even more complicated case. But again, the rule is that if you have something which is the same for all three neutrino species, you can remove it from your Hamiltonian. It doesn't produce any phase difference, at least right. in this situation. Of course, if you have non-inelastic uh, processes, that may, can matter, but not here. Thanks. So, uh, I am just want to finish this part uh, by telling what is uh, the, the experimental setup. We have usually the source then usually have some near detector to control the flux which is coming out of uh, 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 production region and then we have some far detector uh, uh, where we detect the, the neutrinos and um, there are different experiments which aimed at detection of uh, the same type of neutrino which is produced so we call this disappearance experiment or uh, the experiments uh, where the detector detects neutrinos of other type, uh, so then we can actually determine what is disappearance probability or disappearance channel. That we have already discussed, the phase has such an expression, and therefore we can search for oscillations or oscillatory pattern either in distance, changing the distance, ch changing x, or changing the energy. So there are two ways to search for oscillatory effects. Um, so, now I'm starting this uh, um, part on, on the matter effects, and I will use what I have already developed for Viking oscillation, so it will be much, much faster. If there are still some questions to the first part, then please ask me. Because I will, I will be using that spot, what we have discussed already. Not repeating various things. Good. So tell me, suppose you have light, and light is propagating in transparent medium. So what happens? So you have just a spherical ball of glass, and light is propagating. So what happens? Which type of phenomena you expect to, to see? Refraction. This is refraction phenomena, right? So you have refraction index in transparent. Uh, 
And you may have some reflections. You may have internal reflection inside your bowl. Uh, or if uh, your system is such that uh, uh, this refraction index is different for different polarization, you may have rotation or polarization of the light in your medium. Now imagine that the Earth, the Sun, and many other things are just these glass balls for neutrinos. Neutrinos have no practically negligible inelastic uh, interactions, and the only what happens is just refraction phenomena. The Earth is some this transparent ball for neutrinos at low energies. Right? And so the only what happens is this refraction phenomena. And so you can estimate significance of kind of refraction phenomena and inelastic processes by just comparing imaginary and real parts of the amplitude. So you can consider scattering amplitudes, and then imaginary part uh, is responsible for inelastic processes. And the real part of the amplitude is precisely giving you refraction phenomena. Refraction phenomena. And uh, uh, so I don't know if this formula exists here. No, it's not. But, uh, but the ratio of this uh, imaginary and real parts is something like S total energy in the center of mass over the mass of W boson squared. So if you have lower energies, then you can neglect the uh, uh, inelastic part, and the only phenomena you see is just this refraction phenomena. So we will discuss now refraction phenomena of neutrinos. And the first person who started to do this was Lincoln Wolfenstein, who unfortunately died just two months ago. Uh, so the one of the person who actually has driven all these uh, developments. Now, elastic forward scattering, this is what actually is responsible for refraction phenomena, can be described by, the pot by potential. So you can imagine that neutrino light also, neutrino propagates in medium, and then it just uh, suffers from forward scattering, forward scattering, and that can be described by just uh, potential. So the medium creates potential in which your uh, neutrinos propagate. Uh, and actually, refraction index, its deviation from one is just given by this uh, potential over the momentum. And uh, for instance, for 10 MeV neutrinos, inside the Earth, this n minus 1 is 10 to the minus 20. And inside the sun is 10 to the minus 18. And what is important here, again, the difference of the potentials. There's always difference of the potentials is important, not just absolute value. And here we are speaking about difference of the potentials for different neutrino species, in particular for electron neutrino and for muon neutrino, electron neutrino and tau neutrino. And so we need actually to look at the interactions which differ electron neutrino and uh, muon neutrino. And the only diagram, the only process which in standard model gives these differences, this one, scattering of electron neutrinos on electrons due to charge currents. All other diagrams are common. They are the same for muon neutrino and tau neutrino. So this is the only process which gives the difference. And uh, we can compute what is the potential which is produced by this type of scattering. And uh, so this is given by G Fermi. We are at low energies. We just use four fermionic uh, uh, Hamiltonian the square root of two, and of course it should be proportional to the density of the electrons. You can actually even use these dimensional arguments to derive such a formula, because you know the bigger amount of density of the electrons, the stronger refraction phenomena, right? At least in some interval, it's just linear. And G Fermi is uh, uh, giving you the strength of interaction. So it's very clear, and you can use dimensions. Nothing more can be essentially written. I have here more. Uh, detailed derivation, but I will not focus much on this. If you want, you can go through these slides or ask me. Essentially, you need to compute effective uh, Hamiltonian when you make kind of averaging over integration of the wave functions of the medium, and that produces for you the density of the electrons. Now, suppose we have now neutrino propagating a medium, and in this case, you need to add term to your Hamiltonian which corresponds to interaction of neutrino with medium. So we add to our Hamiltonian this V term, right? So we have neutrino, and they interact in medium. There's some energy associated to this interaction, so we need to add to Hamiltonian, which is the energy, right, operator. So we have the zero part and V. Now let us compare how we move from vacuum case uh, to the case in matter. So in, in vacuum, we have this H zero. Now we have this additional term. Now we have different Hamiltonian. The eigenstates in 
vacuum are nu1 and nu2. Eigenstates are the mass states, right? So in the vacuum, the eigenstates of Hamiltonian are mass states. So mass states propagate independently, right? So if you produce mass state, it will propagate, it will not transform to anything. Now in uh, matter, because of the presence of additional term, you will have some other set of the eigenstates which differ from mass states. So in medium, some other states propagate independently if medium has a constant density. And of course, eigenvalues change. So in vacuum, we had this eigenvalues, which is determined by the mass of neutrino and the energy. And here we'll have something else. I will show you expressions for this. Now, how we define the mixing in medium? In vacuum, mixing connects flavor states with mass states. In medium, mixing in medium connects, again, flavor states with eigenstates in medium. Well, actually, what is interesting, and I will discuss this uh, later, that uh, mass eigenstates start to oscillate in medium. So if you have just new one state with definite mass, and then it enters medium, it starts to oscillate because it's not eigenstate in medium. And recently, Super K collaboration has published uh, kind of about three sigma effect of, uh, so day night effect on solar neutrinos, and it is related to oscillations of mass states inside the Earth. So it's not just an abstract thing, so we actually observe now these effects. Now this is, uh, uh, again, evolution question with uh, the parts which I have explained already. The matrix of potentials uh, is given here, again, in two by two case, so it's diagonal. And this VE is precisely what you saw before, square root of 2, G Fermi, and uh, the density of the electrons. So it's important that this matrix is diagonal. And again, uh, the difference of the potentials it, it, it matters here. In general, you have uh, here some V uh, electron generals. Here is v, v mu. But the difference is, uh, is this VE. So you can subtract common parts. This is for oscillation phenomena. However, if you want to discuss some kind of internal refraction and many others in reflection, then you need to take total potential. For oscillations, uh, the difference matters. So and here is explicit form for this evolution equation in terms of mixing angles, delta m squared, and here you see this VE. Now you can use this equation and you can diagonalize this and find what is the mixing angle, right? So you find this relation between flavor states and eigenstates diagonalizing Hamiltonian. And this is the expression for mixing angle in uh, medium. So what is important here, sine squared two theta m is proportional to vacuum. And you have here denominator, which has some kind of interesting uh, uh, dependence on parameters. Here you see this two energy potential over delta m squared, squared, and then it's sine squared to theta. So if potential is zero, then denominator is just one, and you get uh, come back to vacuum expression for mixing angle. Now here is an interesting factor. Because at some energies and potentials, it can be zero, right? Uh, and uh, this size of the potential is given. Here, this is what is called a resonance condition. If this condition is satisfied, then your uh, mixing angle in medium becomes just one because this term vanishes, and you have sine squared to theta here and here, and so it just gives you one. So this is the resonance. This is a resonance condition. This is resonance in, in, in neutrino mixing. Okay. Now, you can also find immediately what are eigenvalues when you make diagonalization of your Hamiltonian. And the difference of the eigenvalues, which is important here, again, is given by such an expression, which is essentially square root of what is staying here. This is delta m squared over two energies. This is what you would have in vacuum. And these are additional terms. And again, this term becomes 1 when potential is 0. Now, let me show you some pictures. Uh, so here you see dependence of uh, mixing angle in medium or on density or energy are actually in this combination. This is uh, zero, and here are for two mixing angles now, since we are now generalizing the, for three neutrino case. For small mixing angle, like one, three, you will have this sharp 
peak resonance peak. For a large mixing, which is realized for one to mixing, the peak is very wide. So this is what we call resonance. What is the meaning of the resonance? You can rewrite this condition for mixing angle to be one in matter in such a form, and it uh, gives you, clarifies the physical meaning of, mix, of, of resonance. The oscillation length in vacuum equals, in the resonance, so-called refraction lengths multiplied by cosine two theta. I'm sorry I have forgotten to introduce this refraction length. It was in the first uh, slide here. So let me come back. So uh, we introduce potential, and then we can introduce refraction lengths, which is just two pi over V. And uh, the meaning of this refraction length is this is the distance over which the phase, additional phase, associated with interactions will be two pi. So we had just now two contributions to our phase. One is from difference of delta m squares, right, which we have discussed, but also it will be contribution to phase due to interaction with medium. And the distance, refraction length is the distance over which we get this additional two pi phase. So the meaning of resonance and if mixing is small, mixing angle is small, is that refraction length is approximately equal to oscillation length in uh, medium. So the sense is very clear and uh, physically simple. So you have medium, and it is characterized by frequency, which is 1 over L0. So it's essentially frequency. And you have the system, which is characterized by its own frequency, which is 1 over L nu in vacuum, right? So resonance when these two frequencies coincide. So that's a common meaning of the resonance. So that's or vacuum oscillation length is approximately refraction length. This is when resonance happens. Questions? Yeah. Oh, so you go back to the resonance condition that you said that, yeah, so uh, here is a, uh, here's my confusion. So the left hand side, this V is completely determined, right? We know the electron density or something. Yeah. But the right hand side, there is some ambiguity. What do we choose for delta m square and cos 2 theta? So uh, how do you guarantee that such a thing so will? In the case of, for instance, solar neutrino, we precisely use this equation to determine what is delta m square solar. Uh, but then you have to choose something for cos cosine two theta also. I mean, right. So this is this is the way, and I will discuss this. How we actually we use these relations to determine neutrino parameters. Okay. So a priori we don't know. Yeah. So so when it was kind of introduced, we didn't know what is delta m square. We didn't know what is this uh, theta angle. Actually, for a long time, even for solar neutrinos, people discussed that maybe mixing angle is very small, or maybe large and different ranges of delta m squares have been dis uh, are considered. Yes, okay. In, in, inside the supernova, there are even two resonances, both resonances, which are related to delta m square one, two, and one, three are realized. It's an even more complicated situation. Now, this is the picture which is complementary. This is dependence of eigenvalues of Hamiltonian for large mixing and for small mixing. And near the resonance, the splitting is, becomes very small. And you can find this uh, from expression which I have uh, written for you, the difference of two eigenvalues. So this is nothing but level crossing phenomena, which is very common in physics and appears in many places. And uh, so it's also very, a very simple way to see how transitions occur. So again, this is dependence of, uh, of uh, Eigen uh, values of our system on density. Here is a density or energy. Nobody asked me what is this negative part. What is negative part? So you see, even in the previous, it was negative value. Here, you see, it's, it's negative. It's zero. And what's interesting that this is continuous continuation to this negative part. So what is this negative part of these uh, diagrams? Huh? No. 
So these are the scales is uh, uh, n over e or v over e if you want. Oh, oh I, I don't hear you. Sorry. If you have holes in the Dirac C, you have something like negative energy, uh, negative electron density. Very simply, it's just for neutrino channel. <laughs> so what is interesting, if you have resonance in neutrino channel, there is no resonance in anti-neutrino channel. And actually, this uh, uh, plane corresponds to negative value of V. I have. I put here an N, but more correctly, one, I need to put potential. A potential may have different signs, right? So it can be positive and negative. It has opposite sign for neutrinos and antineutrinos. So this part of the plane corresponds to antineutrinos, to negative value of potential. So this is uh, this level crossing uh, scheme for three neutrinos. And uh, let me, just this last uh, topic which I want to discuss, what's, what's going on uh, with, uh, with oscillations. Actually, if the density is constant, if you have uniform medium, then everything is exactly like in the case of vacuum oscillations. You have uh, precisely the same expression for oscillation probability with the only difference that now you need to put here mixing angle in medium and here you need to put oscillation lengths in medium. And oscillation lengths of medium is 2 pi, I don't think us, it's here, 2 pi over difference of eigenvalues. This is general expression, and it is reduced to our usual expression if you are in vacuum. And a maximal effect, again, when this sine squared to theta is 1, and this is the resonance. Uh, so this is how the oscillation length in matter depends on energy. So it uh, increases with energy at lower energies, then it becomes very big in resonance, and then it approaches to refraction lengths. So oscillation length also depends on, on energy here. This is again expression for refraction lengths, and this is oscillation lengths. And uh, so, uh, now it's just immediate uh, consequence of what we have discussed, resonance enhancement of oscillation. Suppose we have the source, which produces some spectrum of neutrino. It propag neutrinos propagate in medium with constant density and then uh, detected here. Then what you will observe in your detector, so if this is what has, uh, so you will observe then the ratio of uh, fluxes, suppose you have electron neutrino and uh, you uh, Again, your detector detects electron neutrino, then the ratio of absorbed flux over initial one will have this oscillatory picture, which is in green line. So this is in energy scale. And at uh, energies which are close to resonance energy, you have uh, oscillations with maximum depth. So this is oscillation in energy scale. Uh, so this is for two different uh, widths of the layer. So you have different patterns. Now, if, if mixing is small, then the resonance, resonance is narrow, and you, you get your ratio of probabilities uh, uh, of this type or, or this type, de depending on the uh, width of your layer. So this is actually what is realized in the case of propagation of atmospheric neutrinos or accelerator neutrinos inside the Earth. And so this is graphic representation of this effect when you have uh, uh, Resonance, then the mixing angle is uh, uh, mixing angle is uh, pi over four, right? So then two uh, mixing angles is just give you pi over two, and then what happens? Your cone becomes completely open. So the axis, two mixing angles, which determine the axis of the cone. This is the b, is uh, pi over two. And then the oscillation will proceed just like a rotation or precession uh, along this axis x. And of course, then you have maximal change of the projection on the axis z. So if you have the spectrum, uh, then for different energies, uh, neutrinos will uh, uh, evolve around, move over the surfaces of different cones. This is for energy one, so you will have such an evolution. For some different energy, which is closer to resonance, it will be evolution in this way, then it will be like this, and precise in resonance evolution will be of this uh, type. 
and uh, probably I stop here. Thank you.